The Commission will come to order. I want to welcome everybody to the Commission's January 2023 meeting. I want to uh, thank of all of our technical staff. We are back in our own room today, and I, for one, am glad uh, to be so here. So I want to thank uh, uh, the Office of the Chairman, the Office of the Managing Director, all of our IT staff uh, for making sure that that is possible. Uh, today, we will continue the practice of directing a portion of the Commission's open session to providing important updates on the Commission's implementation of the Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 2022. As we move forward with implementing the many directives enacted with a broad bipartisan support in the U.S. Congress and signed by President Biden, we will continue to use the open sessions of our commission meetings to answer some of the most frequently act asked questions from the public and share updates on the progress. Now, as the commission implements uh, the OSRA 2022, we are cognizant of the deadlines that Congress established, and uh, we know that they were not intended uh, to be optional. However, we also know that the Congress does not want to sacrifice responsiveness and effectiveness for speed. Many in Congress, including many of the co-authors of the legislation, have made it clear to me that when push comes to shove, getting it right is more important than getting it fast. Accordingly, I determined that the Commission needs additional time to thoroughly consider the comments on the proposed rule and address the many of the valid concerns raised. Now, I am very gratified, by the way, by the number and diversity of comments we received and very pleased to see that all segments of the industry have provided the Commission with their input about the draft rule as it was proposed. I do think this is an innovative rule, and so that is very, very important. Now, we are currently working through these comments, and with the concurrence of my colleagues, the Federal Maritime Commission will issue a supplemental notice of proposed rulemaking to incorporate changes prompted by the feedback. The supplemental notice will include a notice and comment period so that there will be further opportunity for public comments on the revised rule. Now again, as a former member of the Congress, I respect the sense of urgency shown by the Congress and the President, and therefore I am reluctant to prolong the rulemaking process. Nevertheless, it is even more important that the rule achieves the goals that Congress intended. Also in this meeting, we will receive an update from, on, from the economic uh, and competition update, rather, we will receive an economic and competition update from the Bureau of Trade Analysis in both the open and the closed sessions. A portion of the discussion will have to be held in closed session in accordance with the appropriate Sunshine Act exemptions because it is likely to include privileged or confidential commercial or financial information uh, obtained by the Commission. We will, however, have as much as we can in the open session. Before we proceed to the first item on the agenda, I want to yield to my colleague, Commissioner Benzel, for an important update. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I had intended to uh, provide an open briefing on the uh, progress on the Maritime Transportation Data Initiative. Uh, we're getting close, very close on that, uh, to uh, providing uh, public recommendations uh, to the Commission. But I did want to sit down with all of my commissioners before I had done that. So I wanted to take a little extra time, and uh, we'll be having uh, further information on uh, what uh, those recommendations would be after those. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Benzel. I will just say that uh, given the scope of this project uh, with the MTDI, um, I don't think you should be uh, at all uh, um, embarrassed or anything like that. And, and I'm very, very grateful that you will be uh, updating all of us. I heard a little bit from you yesterday on it. Very interesting stuff, but a lot of issues involved in that. And so I do think it's important to keep, uh, to keep all of our colleagues um, updated. Uh, with that, um, Mr. Secretary, the Commission is ready for the first item on the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the first item on the agenda is staff briefing by on the Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 2022. This item will be presented by Chris Huey, General Counsel, and Tara Nielsen of the Office of Managing Director. Please proceed. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Maffei and Commissioners. Thank you so much for the opportunity to discuss the Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 2022, which we'll uh, call OSRA 2022 or just simply OSRA in this meeting. I'll be presenting with General Counsel Chris Huey. Our goal today is to update the public not only about the status of implementation of OSRA at the FMC, but also to give additional guidance on certain provisions of OSRA that we think will be helpful. 
just as we did in our July and September meetings where we talked about ASRA for ease of organization, we've prioritized and we've grouped the law's provisions by the topic of enforcement and consumer assistance with themes of exports throughout. Included in our presentation will be information on ongoing rulemakings. I'd like to remind our public viewers that a lot of what we're going to cover today can be found on the Commission's website, www.fmc.gov. We've created an OSRA implementation page, and I encourage the public, the ocean shipping industry, um, and anybody else interested to refer to this page for all things OSRA related. Starting with the enforcement topic, I will turn the mic over to Chris to discuss key provisions concerning prohibitions in, in OSRA. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Today, I will provide an update of what we have worked on since the last meeting, focusing on several key rulemakings. Uh, I just want to take two seconds to say that when I say we, I wasn't actually here at the last meeting. Um, I've joined the Commission after uh, 15 years of wandering about uh, Washington and overseas. Uh, very glad to be back uh, and in this role, uh, and I've appreciated the warm welcome I've received uh, in my two and a half months back uh, at the FMC. Uh, in Section 7, OSRA clarified that the existing prohibition on unreasonable refusal to deal or negotiate includes situations regarding the provision of vessel space accommodations provided by an ocean common carrier. OSRA also set out a related provision that prohibits a common carrier from unreasonably refusing cargo space accommodations when available or resorting to other unfair or unjustly discriminatory methods. Both statutory provisions directed the Commission to complete rulemakings to define specific terms. Defining unreasonable refusal to deal or negotiate with respect to vessel space uh, and defining unfair or unjustly discriminatory methods. While these are separate provisions, they are related to each other in that they address aspects of the shipper and carrier relationship regarding vessel and cargo space. And as we have noted, these provisions apply to exports and imports. Commission staff initiated the rulemaking on unreasonable refusal to deal immediately upon the passage of OSRA, and a proposed rule was published on September 21, 2022. During the 30-day comment period, the agency received comments from 26 different entities with diverse views. Commission staff continue to review these comments uh, to help with next steps responding to the issues that the comments have raised. The comments included issues such as the elements proposed as considerations when analyzing the reasonableness of a carrier's apparent refusal to deal or negotiate, the possibility of specifying presumptively unreasonable conduct in the new rule, and whether a carrier should be required to have a documented export strategy or whether, as proposed initially, such a strategy is but one of the considerations in analyzing an alleged refusal to deal. We are currently, as you have noted, Mr. Chairman, preparing a supplemental notice of proposed rulemaking to allow the Commission to address these types of proposals and to enable further comment from the public. Turning to another major rulemaking mandated by OSRA, Section 7C requires that the Commission define the phrase unfair or unjustly discriminatory methods uh, in the context of uh, unreasonably refusing cargo space accommodations when available or resorting to other unfair or unjustly discriminatory methods. Commission staff are drafting a proposed rule for the Commission's consideration to address this new statutory requirement. We look forward to sharing more information on this project soon. OSRA also addressed demurrage and detention in Section 7, allowing the Commission to adjust the information requirements of an invoice through a rulemaking. As the result of a recommendation growing out of Fact Finding 29, the Commission had already begun work on this front through an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking published on February 15, 2022, before OSRA became law. The Commission received over 80 comments to the ANPRM. Beneficial cargo owners, shippers, and truckers were supportive of requiring minimum information, while common carriers and marine terminal operators opposed this as too burdensome and costly. There were also many comments, especially from truckers, asking that the Commission issue rules clarifying who can be properly billed for demerge and detention charges. The Commission issued a notice of proposed rulemaking on October 14, 2022, that proposed to adopt minimum information that common carriers must include in a demerge or detention invoice. The rule would also add to this list additional information that must be included in or with such an invoice. 
further define prohibited practices by clarifying which parties may be appropriately billed for demerge and detention charges, and establish billing practices that billing parties must follow when invoicing for demerge or detention charges. The comment period for this proposed rule closed about a month ago, December 13, 2022. The Commission received over 180 comments to the proposed rule, and our staff is currently reviewing and analyzing these comments. Speaking of rulemakings more broadly, it is important to note that in October of 2022, the Commission launched a new way for interested parties to comment on its proposed rules and other notices. This is via the website regulations.gov. This initiative provides a streamlined experience for members of the public who want to read and comment on the Commission's rulemaking activities. This update and docketing systems is one of the opportunities that the Commission is addressing as a result of the authorities provided in Section 17 of OSRA. We hope to continue to improve the user experience as we integrate new technology and tools to better assist the public. Finally, since OSRA's promulgation, the Commission has received numerous requests for informal guidance. The Commission recently added a section to its OSRA Implementation Tracker webpage addressing some of the most frequently asked questions. Current topics there include charge complaints, demerge and detention billing, and the rulemaking process generally. We encourage the public to review this webpage before submitting requests for informal guidance, as the question might have already been answered. This concludes the update on OSRA rulemakings and related projects. Uh, I now turn to Tara Nielsen for an update on charge complaints. Thank you. Charge complaints is found in Section 10 of OSRA, <clears throat> and it enables shippers to submit to the FMC information about complaints of charges assessed by a common carrier. In the new provision, the FMC is authorized to promptly investigate information concerning these complaints and order refunds or penalties for charges that don't comply with the two sections of the Shipping Act um, that charge complaints handles. As discussed in September's meeting, the Commission has adopted an interim procedure for handling charge complaints. Since the enactment of OSRA, the Commission's received over 200 charge complaints and more come in each week. Approximately one-third of them have been perfected, which means they had sufficient information and met the base threshold for investigation. Some investigations were not opened because they concerned matters that predated the passage of OSRA, or the submissions were incomplete, or the matters submitted were not suitable for a charge complaint investigation. From June to January of this year, the FMC has opened 72 charge complaint investigations. 53 of those investigations were either completed, meaning the carriers voluntarily issued a refund of waiver or the case was closed after investigation. 18 of those investigations determined that the evidence did not support a claim that the charges were not in compliance with the charge complaint sections of the Shipping Act. Those shippers were notified of this determination and other potential avenues at the FMC for pursuing their complaint. Three cases were referred to the Office of Enforcement under the new process to move forward with the order to show cause. As of January, two of those refunded the charges before the order to show cause was issued, and one is pending and is under review to be sent to the Commission for consideration. The charge complaint process is already having success in driving informal settlements and waivers of demerge and detention billings. The Commission encourages such settlements when mutually reached between the shipper and the carrier. We thought it would be useful to recap what falls under charge complaints. The new charge complaints process is appropriate for charges incurred, invoiced, or assessed after June 16, 2022. Charges must have been invoiced or assessed. And the charges assessed have to involve transportation of cargo within the Commission's jurisdiction meaning carriage of cargo in the U.S. to foreign ocean-borne trades. Also, the complaints have to be about disputed shipping-related charges. Charge complaints procedures don't apply to charges that are invoiced or assessed prior to OSRA, charges assessed by an MTO, a marine terminal operator, or an other party um, than a common carrier, unless they're assessing it on behalf of a common carrier. They don't apply to charges that haven't yet been invoiced or assessed. And it does not apply to charges assessed on export cargo loading on a vessel at a non-US port 
or on import cargo that's discharging from a vessel at a non-US port. Also, it does not apply to complaints related to other carrier actions that don't fall within the sections specifically laid out in charge complaints. So there are several possibilities for outcomes for a charge complaint investigation under the interim procedure we're following. Most commonly, the carrier either waives the charge or in instances where an invoice has already been paid, refunds the charge to the charge complaint filer. Common carriers sometimes choose this option once the commission notifies the common carrier that an investigation has begun. If the investigation supports a finding that the common carrier's charge is not in compliance with the law, both parties will be informed that the matter is now referred to the commission's Office of Enforcement for further commission action. The charge complaint filer will no longer be involved in pursuing the matter. Under the interim process, the Office of Enforcement pursues the charge complaint on behalf of the complainant. The commission will determine whether or not the charge is appropriate, and if it's not, the commission will order a refund or a waiver of the charge. The commission will also determine whether to refer the matter to an administrative law judge for a civil penalty proceeding. Experience gained from this interim procedure is going to guide the commission on what a permanent process should take. A permanent procedure will be completed through a formal rulemaking process where we can receive notice and public comment. For more information on charge complaints, the public can go to the FMC's website where we have guidance and frequently asked questions. The commission is also in the process of publishing a webinar on charge complaints, which will be on the commission's website in the next few weeks. And of course, we're standing by to assist anyone with questions and they can send those by email. if They're not already answered on our frequently asked questions. I'm now gonna talk about the consumer assistance provisions of OSRA in our implementation updates on what we've been doing. Under section 17A, the FMC is required to establish a web page that allows for the submission of com complaints, comments, concerns, reports of non-compliance with the Shipping Act, requests for investigation, and requests for alternative dispute resolution services. Commission staff is working hard on our interim solution that satisfies the requirement, and we're also currently mapping out a long-term option. Under Section 17B, we're required to maintain our Office of Consumer Affairs and Dispute Resolution Services, or CATERS, to provide ombuds assistance, mediation, informal dispute facilitation, and arbitration to resolve commercial, household goods shipments, and passenger cruise disputes. CATERS is standing by to assist with all shipping issue disputes. We've recently brought on additional staff with ocean transportation experience, and we encourage the ocean shipping industry and the public to reach out for assistance in resolving their disputes that don't or shouldn't rise to the level of litigation. And CATERS contact information can be found on the FMC website. Next, under Section 17C, the Commission is required to increase its staff with not fewer than seven total positions to assist in investigations and oversight within the Bureau of Enforcement, the Bureau of Certification and Licensing, the Office of the Managing Director, Consumer Affairs and Dispute Des Resolution Services, and the Bureau of Trade Analysis. While Congress gave the Commission 18 months to comply with this provision, the positions have already been identified and hiring has been completed for five of them and is underway with four additional positions in the Office of Enforcement, Investigators, the Bureau of Certification and Licensing, the Bureau of Trade Analysis, and CATERS. Next, Section 18 of OSTRA provides the FMC with temporary emergency authority to issue an emergency order requiring any common carrier or marine terminal operator to share certain information with shippers and other entities in emergency situations that impact the competitiveness and reliability of the international transportation supply system. The Commission issued a request for information on current conditions. After a careful review of market conditions that included public comment under the request for information, staff found circumstances currently do not warrant invoking temporary emergency authority, and the Commission will not be issuing an emergency order at this time. However, this authority continues through December 16, 2023, and the FMC will continue to monitor conditions 
and may consider in the future whether an emergency order will be issued. Next, under Section 19 um, of OSRA, the FMC was directed to enter into an agreement with the Transportation Research Board of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, under which the TRB will carry out a study and develop best practices for on-terminal or near-terminal chassis pools that provide service to marine terminal operators, motor carriers, railroads, and other stakeholders using the chassis pools with the goal of optimizing supply chain effectiveness and efficiency. Efforts are already well underway, and we expect that the study will be completed on time by January 2024, and the FMC will post the best practices that come from it. To meet this goal, the FMC and the TRB executed a contract in September of 2022, and a committee has been formed. Initial public meetings will be held shortly. And finally, OSTRA contains certain reporting and publishing requirements for the Commission that we're currently preparing to execute, including a report to Congress on practices by state-owned, state-controlled, and certain foreign-owned ocean common carriers. We're also going to publish annually on our website false demerge and detention invoice information and all penalties imposed or assessed against common carriers. The FMC is also responsible for publishing a quarterly report describing the total import and export tonnage and the total loaded and empty TEUs per vessel making port in the U.S. and its territories. Planning and preparation for this is well underway. On August 8th, we issued the 60-day Federal Register notice on the, for an information collection and received comments back, which were reviewed. On December 9th, the 30-day notice was published in the Federal Register, and we received one comment, which is under review. We appreciate the comments that we've received from the public as we consider this information collection. That concludes our presentation on the Commission's implementation of OSRA. We look forward to keeping the public apprised of our progress and will continue to issue industry advisories or guidance as necessary. Thank you all for your time and attention today, and we are available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Nielsen, for that uh, very professional and complete uh, um, presentation. And uh, thank you, Mr. Huey, for your presentation, and welcome back to the Commission. I will now yield to my colleagues for questions and comments about the presentation. Commissioner Dye. Thank you very much. I appreciate the briefing, um, and uh, Mr. Chairman, I support the decision to issue a supplementary rule on unreasonable refusal to deal. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Dye. Commissioner Benzel. Um, I, I also, uh, Mr. Chairman, support the decision to uh, uh, to uh, get uh, solicit uh, additional comments for the uh, refusals to deal uh, language. The uh, language we're talking about was uh, initially uh, enacted uh, in 1884 under the ICA Act, and then in the shipping context in 1916. I don't think we've done anything uh, with respect to those provisions since the mid-1930s. So a little extra time uh, uh, is not going to hurt. Uh, but uh, but uh, I did, uh, I, I'm sort of uh, reluctant to, to move forward with this quote, but, uh, but I, I believe we really need to get this well. Uh, uh, done and, and and take our time, uh, and I'm actually quoting a article in the sports section. I, I told Commissioner Dye this was was going to happen. Uh, uh, made by a, uh, a, a the center for the Philadelphia Eagles, uh, quoting uh, Calvin Coolidge, one of the worst uh, presidents in the United States uh, history. Uh, but this is a very good quote, and I think it's appropriate. Uh, 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 Nothing in this world uh, can take the the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Uh, un, uh, genius will not unrewarded. Genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The slogan "Press on" has solved and will always solve the problems of the human race. So, press on. So, uh, no further uh, questions. Thank you, I think. Thank you, Commissioner Benzel. <laughs>
Commissioner Sola. That's pretty hard to follow. Um, Mr. General Counsel Tara, thank you very much for a very informative and, 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 and good briefing. Um, I, I also concur that the refusal to, to deal is the, the most complicated part of OSERA that was given to us, and we should take our time to make sure that we get it right. And um, uh, I guess I would say uh, kind of a, a shout out on when you were doing the complaints that we're also um, integrating and also involving caters in that process as well, because a good, um, a good agreement settlement between the parties is much better than a, uh, th than to have a complaint linger on and then go into enforcement action. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Sola. Commissioner Vekic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll uh, join the chorus and uh, make it unanimous and I agree. I pr absolutely support the uh, uh, more time to get it right uh, approach. Uh, I have three questions on Austrian implementation. Um, <clears throat> Congress has given us the mandate to promptly investigate charge complaints. I heard from you that staff is acting promptly. Can you say a bit more about the timing of these investigations? Sure. Thank you, Commissioner. We are moving very, very promptly with this. Um, the whole process is streamlined to get this done on a fast track, which means carriers are contact information um, within days of receiving the complaint. Um, currently, assignment in the preliminary review is done within five calendar days of the complaint coming in, and then carriers are notified and the investigation is underway. Once the investigation is complete, again, within weeks, not months, the order to show cause, this is also a simplified, streamlined process, um, and that will give carriers a formal opportunity to respond to the charges. But again, this is going to move very quickly. So thank you for the question. Well, you bet. And uh, just to, in contrast, uh, we're taking your time to get it right, perhaps, but you're, as far as enforcement, you're pushing right on and right ahead. So this is great. Um, you talked about complaints being resolved before the Commission makes a determination or orders a refund. I know that the Commission has yet to uh, formally order a refund because refunds, refunds have often been paid voluntarily by carriers during the investigation phase. Is there a way to value the total refund, the mm. total refunded under the charge complaints? We have done some preliminary analysis on that, and the staff estimate is over $700,000 in refunds for the charge complaints that have been filed. And that number, we believe, will continue to grow. I think maybe you ought to get some smiley face buttons to send to shippers, <laughs> too, uh, along, along those lines. And um, it sounds like a lot of the previous work of the commission is uh, bearing fruit here. And I, meant, I mean that, Commissioner Dye, about you. So. Um, and finally, uh, do you have a sense of what impacts the charge complaints and our increased enforcement efforts have had on the industry? And have you seen uh, an increased willingness on behalf of the carriers to resolve their disputes? I would say we've definitely been seeing that. Um, I think carriers are taking very seriously um, charge complaints and other enforcement measures. And I think we are seeing um, what started out as a larger amount of cases, although cases are still coming in and we think that this process is valuable, um, that have come in less frequently, which may be an indication that it's having a deterrent impact. Thank, thank you. I've heard anecdot anecdotal information, but I wanted to be sure uh, people just weren't telling me what I wanted to hear. So thank you very much. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I just have one thing. To Thank add. you, Commissioner Beckage. I'll yield back to Commissioner Dye. Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate your good work. Thank you very much. Um, however, we want to make sure um, that um, the charges comply with the law and the incentive principle. Um, but um, we don't want to interfere with reasonable charges. Um, to keep cargo moving. We've just begun to clear off the ports. Um, and um, so it sounds to me like you have a very, a very good handle on that. 
and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Dye. Um, I will just uh, associate myself with Commissioner Dye. It's very important that we set the right balance. I think uh, we are doing that. Um, a couple of quick questions, uh, Ms. Nielsen. Um, one is the chart complaint procedures. Um, those are still interim procedures, correct? They can still be improved. And, and if, if a, um, a complainant or, a, or a, any, anyone in the uh, shipping community, carrier, et cetera, um, has suggestions on that, where, where would they direct them? Absolutely. Um, certainly, if they want to um, give feedback before we go out for notice of, you know, for public comment, they can contact charge complaints at fmc.gov. That is the address to file a charge complaint, but we could um, certainly take them there. And I would generally, if they have questions or comments on OSRA, including charge complaints, they should contact the general counsel's office. And I believe that's general counsel at fmc.gov. General counsel is nodding in agreement to that uh, website address, yes. uh, to that email and, address. And to be clear, if they do send it to charge complaints at FMC, we will be working with the general counsel's office on all rulemaking. Thank you, Ms. Nielsen. It sounds like we have a ton of these charge complaints, which I think is very good. It's, it's very, uh, it means that the law, I think, was uh, certainly um, uh, very welcome um, by the shipping community. Um, but of course, we don't, we, we at the commission only see the ones that are really going to sort of the final stages. Um, is, are we able to process a lot of those? Why aren't we seeing more of them? Are, there, are they being settled? Yep, they are being settled. So for the cases that we have made a preliminary determination at the investigation stage that it should go forward, they have been settled. Um, Two had gone to the Office of Enforcement, and one had actually gone to the commission um, on notation, but had settled prior to uh, a vote on whether to issue. So it doesn't mean the chippers aren't, aren't, aren't getting anywhere with them. It actually means that once the process has been opened, um, the, whoever the, the, if the charge is at all in excess or something, that they're, they're working something out pretty quickly, it sounds like. That's absolutely a fair statement, yes. Okay, that's good. Um, thank you very much again for your, your diligence. Um, I'll ask a question, uh, Mr. Huey, of course, uh, always a little bit nervous about the answer to this, but um, obviously I, we, we still intend to try to get this um, rulemaking um, on uh, unreasonable refusal to, uh, to um, uh, take cargo, unreasonable refusal, refusing of cargo. Um, as quickly as possible. Can you estimate at all, you know, what, once we do this supplemental rule, very approximately, but how long that process will be? Uh, so one of the decisions the commission will need to make is how long it would like the comment period to be. That can be 30 days, that could be 60 yeah, days. I will advocate for 30 days. I'm not going to speak for any of my commissioners. In fact, I won't even commit. If they, if they give me a convincing argument that it needs to be longer, I'll consider that. But at the moment, my, my feeling is 30 days. So... Yeah, but it, beyond that comment period, what what else is involved? Uh, once the comments are received, of course, we will have to digest them and uh, come up with uh, recommendations for the commission about various potential policy forks in the road. Um, but in light of uh, how important this rulemaking is, we will certainly be making it our number one priority uh, within OGC. Uh, I don't want to give a date certain because that might be quoted somewhere. I'm not um, asking for a date certain. Um, but uh, yes, we will be uh, full court press uh, yeah, to continue with the sports analogies. Yeah, I my can't quote Coolidge though. My hoping is my hope is still in the in the next it, it, you know the next several months we'll be able to get something done. My also hope is is that the detention to merge billing rule is still you know on target. Um, I think following the incentive principle is absolutely key there, uh, and I believe that all of the commissioners are united in doing that. Um, so then, just a quick a, a quick comment on this. Um, I realize that you know doing the supplemental rulemaking and and uh, um, not complying with the, one of our deadlines, people we will get some criticism, um, and I respect that. And I, as chairman, I think uh, take responsibility for that. Um, and I explained why, and, and you know, the, but I do, listening to all of the stuff, the various rulemakings that we're doing, uh, that Mr. Huey outlined, particularly detention to merge, and all of the different things on charred complaints, our consumer 
uh, Affairs uh, Bureau is is souped up in getting many, many, many more cases and helping many, many more uh, shippers uh, and uh, passengers and other clients. Um, our uh, enforcement, um, our uh, now we call them investigators, our field investigators, all of these things, are even our um, administrative law judges, we are getting far, far more cases. Office of the Secretary, I, I could go on and on and on. Um, and so there will be some people, you know, you, you, there's that expression, you can either see the glass is half full or half empty. In my view, the glass is 90% full. There will be some people that just insist on, uh, on focusing on the 10% empty. Uh, but in my view, uh, this commission, thanks to its dedicated staff um, and cooperation with the public, are fulfilling this very ambitious uh, act that was passed and, and signed into law last June um, almost completely. And I'm very, very, uh, give you the credit for that. I'm very, very proud that that is happening. Um, but I do want to make sure that uh, that that the public does realize that so many of these deadlines are being met, and so many of these processes are in place. And I think uh, any reasonable observer, looking a couple of years ago, uh, before you know the act was even contemplated, and and when we were in the midst of uh, all the challenges of COVID and the and the incredible lines in front of some of our ports and all this congestion, I would scarcely believe how much the situation has improved, how organized we are as a regulator, um, how engaged we are as a regulator, hoping again that we're setting the right balance. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm very, very proud of the staff and the work they've done. And I know there have been a lot of long hours and a lot of work-life balance uh, uh, decisions being made. And, and I just want to say that I thank you for that. And I do believe that uh, the American public uh, is, is very grateful. So uh, thank you again uh, for all of that. And again, thank you to Mr. Huey and Ms. Nielsen um, and all the FMC staff for your efforts uh, on implementing OSRA. Mr. Secretary, we are ready for the next item on the agenda. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Second item on the agenda today is staff briefing economic and competition update. This item will be presented by the Director of the Bureau of Trade Analysis and Chief Economist Dr. Kristen Monaco and Dr. Grace Wong, Director of Competition Analysis in the Bureau of Trade Analysis. Please proceed. As our esteemed PhD economists are getting themselves settled, I just want to thank them in advance for their uh, presentations. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you for your patience. Um, good morning, Chairman Maffei and Commissioners. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to present this morning. So this morning, we will do a quick overview of key macro and industry indicators and wrap with a brief overview of competition analysis and compliance. And obviously, more details on competition analysis will be provided in the closed session. All the slides that are on the screen are actually presented better in the chart books that you were provided in advance of today's meeting. There is more in the chart book than will be projected on the slides, and hopefully the chart book is a little easier to read. So starting with GDP, which is presented on page one of your chart book, um, GDP through the fourth quarter has not yet been released. So this chart runs through the third quarter of 2022. Obviously, there was a dip in real GDP at the beginning of 2022 and some recovery in the third quarter. The updated numbers will be reported out next week at the end of the month. The advanced numbers, however, are not particularly promising. The advanced indicators out of the Census Bureau include monthly retail sales, which were down in both December and November. Wholesale and retail inventories increased in November, and um, new durable goods orders decreased in November. So we will give an updated chart to this um, at the end of next week. We focus not just on GDP, understanding the health of the economy as a whole, but the subcomponents of GDP are really important to understand the trade under our scope. If we look at real personal consumption, consumer spending on services in 2022 moved higher than its pre-pandemic levels, and spending on goods, which is very relevant for us and that we track, has flattened somewhat. The share of consumption on goods is still higher than the share pre-pandemic, although the balance has been shifting somewhat. 
looking at the real values of import and exports of goods by value. Um, the real value of imports of goods dipped in the third quarter of 2022, while the value of exports increased. And this is driving the narrowing of the value of the trade deficit for the third quarter. However, the trade deficit remains sizable. Price indices were released by the Bureau of Labor Statistics over the past two weeks. So this is the one chart that's a little more current than what was provided in your chart book because those numbers came out last week. Um, as expected, the low rates for the consumer price index and the producer price index that we saw starting at the end of the summer, continuing through the fall, were also evident in those December numbers. So inflation measures are coming down. We expect for this to continue into the first half of 2023, absent any shocks to, say, energy prices. The import and export prices tend to be a bit more volatile, but if we look at year-over-year -year import prices, those are starting to decline as well. Um, we see year-over-year -year declines for the commodities of interest that we track that tend to be containerized, including the major non-durables and durables that move via container. And moving over to industry indicators, moving away from sort of U.S. measures of inflation to price measures that are relevant to understanding the trade. Spot rates, um, this is presented for Drury, but all the public spot rate measures, including Drury, SCFI, and Freitos, show the rates on inbound trades roughly equivalent now to their pre-pandemic levels, with export rates still at a slightly elevated level. We do expect that export rates may trend down over the next couple of months due to lots of capacity in the market. Looking specifically at what is exported from this country, pages six through nine in your chart book focus on U.S. exports of goods. The charts on pages six and seven use census trade data to show the value of exports for January through October of 2022, which were the most recent data available when we ran this report. The purpose of this chart is to show the commodities that tend to be exported by vessel, so that would be the blue bar, and the subset of that moved by containerized vessel. So at the two-digit commodity level, what is the share that goes out on vessel, and what's the subset of that that goes on containerized vessel? Um, this is based upon value, not volumes, but also really gives a sense of the shares of commodities that are sort of under our scope that we track. Um, these shares, I will note, have not changed appreciably at the two-digit level between 2019 and 2020. You can see commodities such as organic chemicals, fertilizers, and iron and steel tend to move by a vessel, but not containerized vessel. On the other hand, commodities such as paper and paperboard, cotton and edible fruits and nuts, not only move by a vessel, but dominantly move by containerized vessel. Moving away towards, away from the value and towards the volumes, charts pages eight and nine of the chart book use peers data to focus on the volumes of export, again, by these two digit commodity codes, displaying the change in the volumes exported from this country between 2019 and 2022. Um, for equivalent comparison, we're using the first three quarters of each year. We know that there have been changes in exports over the last quarter. When the peers data are updated and certified for December, we will provide an update to this chart. What you will note is that the overlap of the green and purple dots for many of these commodities show that at the commodity group level, there was little change in volumes exported between 2019 and 2022. That doesn't necessarily hold at the detailed level, but at the aggregate level it holds. We have seen substantial increases in exports for commodities falling under the category of furniture and bedding, for example, and decreases in the areas of waste paper and paperboard, which has been well tracked due to sort of uh, changes in China policy. Related to talking about country policies and our trading partners, the next chart displays the share of containerized trade, again using peers data, between the U.S. and its largest trading partners. The reason um, we included this chart is because I think it's really important to note that while China is our largest trading partner, both on the import side and the export side in terms of containerized freight, its share of exports is appreciably smaller. So we know we have a trade deficit by volumes. All of these countries are smaller on the export side than the import side. But it's really important to contextualize that most of our trade is not balanced even by share. So not only are export volumes lower, but the distribution of the foreign markets is different. 
Um, so for example, there's been a lot of news um, this week and last about new services to India. You see that India's share of the export market is proportionally higher than its share of the import market. Looking at volumes by coast, this includes all trades, not just the major east-west trades. Um, as was widely reported by the industry press, East Coast import volumes outpaced the West Coast again across all trades at the end of the year with the gap widening. Once again, this chart will be updated through December once the peers data are certified. Imports through the Gulf ports continue to be at elevated levels. Exports out of the Gulf, however, are not matching that. So while the Gulf tended to have a very even balance between import and export goods, with the increase of import volumes coming in through the Gulf and the congestion that resulted from that, exports are lagging the imports. Delving into this a little bit deeper, looking at the volumes by both trade and coast for the two major um, trade lanes, Trans-Pacific and Transatlantic, um, the chart here that is probably the most interesting is the lower left, which is the volumes of Trans-Pacific trade that are moving through Gulf and East Coast ports, right? So what we've seen over the last couple of years is these Trans-Pacific volumes moving through Gulf ports and moving through East Coast ports has increased, um, while the transatlantic trade has remained relatively stable in terms of which ports are servicing it. Moving to carrier market share, the next set of charts break out the carrier market share by alliance and carrier name. OOCL is included in the Costco numbers for the purpose of this chart. Notable in this chart is the increased market share of MSC. Obviously, in your chart book on page 13, you have both the Trans-Pacific and Transatlantic for the room. This is split into two different sli slides to make it a little easier to read. MSC across all trade lanes is now the largest carrier by volume. While all carriers move substantially larger volumes of imports than exports on our major east-west trades, comparing the share of import and export traffic by trade lane allows us to identify carriers who carry relatively large share of exports. So if you look at their market share of imports compared to their market share of exports, you see some carriers in particular have much higher export market shares than import market shares on the Trans-Pacific. Those include ONE, Costco, and OOCL, and CMACGM. On the next, looking at Transatlantic, you see Haypag Lloyd has a particularly large export market share on that trade between the US and Europe. Recasting this a little bit. Quickly, is that, is that volume or is that uh, value? That is, sorry, that's share. Share so, of? Share of total volumes. Share so of total volumes, okay. Right, it's sort of their market share. If we did it by volume, it's lower across the board. There's no carrier who's doing a one-for-one -one match imports and exports on these major east-west trade lanes. Re-aggregating and recasting this a little bit to show the alliance carrier share, the chart on page 14 and on these next two slides present the trends in the market share by carriers within the alliances between quarter one and quarter three of the corresponding years. Notable on the left-hand side of the chart is that the alliance carrier market share of Trans-Pacific import trade declined in 2021 and 2022. Note that these volumes represent volumes offered within the alliance and outside the alliance. So this is really alliance carriers, not just alliance volumes. Um, obviously notable is today's announcement by the 2M Alliance that they will be ending their alliance in 2025. You see particularly on the market share chart for the transatlantic that the 2M market share particularly of imports has increased substantially over the last couple of years. Um, finally, I wanted to close with an overview of compliance and competition analysis in our bureau. Obviously, the commission issued an industry alert earlier this month regarding the need for carriers and MTOs to keep their FMC Form 1 up to date. We want to reinforce the importance of this. It's important that regulated entities comply with our regulations, and at a bare minimum, this means keeping their FMC 1 up to date so we can find them when we need to talk to them and reach out to them as needed. There have been a number of smaller BOCCs who entered the U.S. trades during the pandemic, particularly on the Trans-Pacific trades, and have since ceased operating in our trades. 
Our staff have been very proactive in identifying these carriers, but it's also incumbent upon all carriers and their tariff publishers, if applicable, to ensure that their information on file with the FMC is accurate and be responsive to outreach from our staff concerning their activities to make sure we have a good understanding of who's operating in the trades. Our staff will continue to review activities under our regulatory scope for compliance and conduct outreach to the public to ensure industry understand the regulations. Informed compliance will be a big effort for the Bureau of Trade Analysis in the upcoming year. On the competition side, we note that many of the recently filed agreements with the FMC have really been amendments to existing slot agreements. There are a few exceptions to this. Um, there have been some changes to cross-alliance BSAs, specifically the Costco ONE OOCL Yang Ming BSA from the Eastern Mediterranean to the U.S. East Coast BSA, dropped Yang Ming as a member at the end of last year and added CMA. There have been a number of canceled agreements, including older, not particularly active MTO agreements, and some agreements between carriers who have left the trades in recent months. There are roughly 350 agreements on file with the FMC, and the dominant category, as has been the case for years, are slot agreements. One filing over the past several months led to a request for additional information. That was the South Atlantic Multiport Chassis Pool Agreement. And RFAI is an important tool used by the Commission to ensure we get the legal and economic information that we need to conduct a rigorous analysis of the agreement upon filing. It's important, however, to note that agreement review is not the only opportunity for the Commission to take actions on a filed agreement. The most competitively concerning agreements are subject to monitoring requirements, and a unique aspect of the federal maritime is that we continue to monitor after agreements go into effect. We use both qualitative and quantitative information to ensure activities are within the scope of the filed agreement and actions taken under the agreement have not, through a decrease in competition, produced an unreasonable increase in costs or an unreasonable decrease in service. And while some misunderstand the antitrust immunity conveyed under the Shipping Act, it is, not, it is limited to the scope of the agreement. It is not carte blanche to undertake any and all collaborative activity. For example, if carriers have agreement authority to collaborate on capacity, this would also not allow them the opportunity to talk about prices, right? That's simply not within the scope of the filed agreement. Um, further, as previously mentioned, violations of any authority under the agreement or actions that reduce in competition would result in recommendations for action um, by the commission. As said before, the monitoring requirements that the commission prescribes are those tailored to be relevant to the scope and authority of the agreement, and an assignment is an economist is assigned to monitor these. Our staff are all highly trained in this area. Monitoring requirements are regularly reviewed and updated to ensure we have the information we need to properly monitor as market conditions change. We most recently reviewed the monitoring requirements for all FMC filed agreements in 2022 and made changes to many, including the alliance reporting requirements. Alliance agreements represent three of roughly 50 agreements that are actively monitored, and the alliance agreements receive a great deal of scrutiny. The provisions of these agreements, I'd like to remind people, are all available on our website through our agreement library. Um, this is actually very informative for the public to understand what is authorized under those alliance agreements. There's a good deal of information in those agreements and all active agreements are available. For example, if one reads the alliance agreements, one notes that there is explicit language in those agreements about blanking or canceling ceilings proportionate to decreases in demand, for example. Dr. Wong will talk more about monitoring and competition analysis in the closed session. And this concludes our open session remarks. Thank you. Dr. Wong. Okay, yeah, that's right. So she'll provide it in the private. Okay, got it. Sorry. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Monaco. I'll now yield to my colleagues uh, for questions and comments about the presentation. Commissioner Dye. Thank you, Doctor. Um, excellent briefing as always. Um, I've been at the Federal Maritime Commission for a long time. We don't usually say how long, um, but um, I've learned a lot. 
I've observed a lot. And I'm convinced that our Bureau of Transportation Analysis is the best I have ever seen. There is a misunderstanding publicly about which I'm concerned that the terms exception to antitrust enforcement means that there is no enforcement of competition among ocean carriers and marine terminals. We know that's not true. Our international partners know that's not true. Uh, during fact-finding 29, I consulted regularly with uh, EU transportation officials just to make sure that there was nothing during this desperate time of rising prices and capacity shortages. There was, there was no, no evidence of reductions in competition that I was missing. And we both agreed um, that we did not see that evidence. So I'll start, General Counsel. What does this term exception to antitrust enforcement mean, actually, under the Shipping Act? Well, thank you, Commissioner Dye. Um, the Shipping Act does indeed provide uh, an um, exemption from the antitrust law for agreements that are filed here. Uh, this is part, uh, though, of an overall comprehensive and industry-specific regulatory uh, regime established by the Shipping Act, and it's what this commission administers. Um, so central to the agency's operations is its administration and protection of competition through its agreement filing and monitoring system. So central is that to the agency's work that it is, in fact, uh, the first objective listed in the Commission's strategic plan. Uh, it's the number one thing that the agency looks at. Uh, it's bread and butter. Uh, one can always quote the statute itself um, uh, with respect to protecting competition uh, or guarding against um, unreasonable reduction in transportation service or an unreasonable increase in transportation costs. Uh, it's right in there in black and white. And um, the, in the event that such um, deleterious uh, economic impacts were identified, uh, the agency is fully empowered uh, by the statute to go into federal district court and seek a permanent injunction against any such agreement. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why you have an Office of General Counsel. Um, we're sure. queued up when you need us. Um, but uh, yes, it is, uh, antitrust immunity isn't anything like, say, diplomatic immunity. Um, it isn't um, an opportunity to, uh, well, um, diplomatic immunity isn't that either. I, I had it once and it's, uh, <laughs> Not as fun as it sounds, I think, but um, <laughs> it's <laughs> uh, not an opportunity for uh, or an invitation to, or as uh, Dr. Monaco said, carte blanche for anti-competitive behavior. Quite the contrary, uh, it is um, this commission's uh, duty and daily work uh, to monitor the competitive impacts of uh, filed agreements. I appreciate it. Um, the chairman and I have discussed a little bit about uh, how um, about um, how we hope um, uh, this will have to get in a long line of, of duties, um, but to provide the public with more information uh, on our website and in other ways um, to increase their confidence in our program um, because it's extensive. I, I often think of these agreements as not only agreements among the competitors, but agreements with us to comply with our rules, our stringent information demands on a continual basis um, that we may decide to change depending on circumstances. It's confidentially filed information. And to my knowledge, the FMC has never been accused of divulging that confidentially filed information. We're cognizant that it is our responsibility to receive it in line with the statute, confidentiality, and we 
we take that as part of our mandate not to divulge confidentially or non-public information like most law enforcement agencies if you don't if you're not careful with that information that's filed on that in that ways or the assurances that you give to parties then nobody's going to talk to you and that would be that would be the end of the arrangement that we have on our competition program and also the way that we learn. We are a specialized agency for liner shipping and through the, our, our flagship program, um, we um, are recognized internationally as experts in liner shipping. If you would just, and I'm sure we'll hear more about this in the private portion, but if you would just talk a little bit about how we treat blank sailings. Certainly, um, and as noted, we will discuss this more in the closed session. Um, as referenced, blank sailings help us understand what's happening with capacity. So they are very closely assessed. We have put a lot of time and attention in making sure the information we get on blank sailings allows us to understand the context around blank sailings. I think we've been very public in stating that when the congestion resulting from the pandemic happened, the types of blank sailings became very different than they were before, right? It wasn't due to a decrease in demand. It was due to schedule on reliability because of congestion inability to get in and get unloaded and reloaded and out the door. And so by collecting that information, but also understanding what's driving any cancellations of sailings, what's driving changes in schedules, allows us to understand what's happening with capacity. And if it's being driven proportional to demand, or if it's just an unprecedented case, as we saw during the pandemic, where it was stemming from congestion and trying to realign schedules resulting in effectively a decrease in capacity because sailings were being canceled. So that is something we track very carefully. We want to understand the root cause of that, and we get that information and spend a lot of time making sure we understand that information and what's underlying it so it can go into our analysis of what's happening with capacity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, I, I, would, I would like our website to reflect that um, we use the same competition tools that our sister competition agencies use. We use the guidelines um, for collaborations among competitors. We compute the um, concentrations of our markets. Uh, in the same way. And um, so I look forward to the next um, uh, iteration of our website. Thank you. Thank you for the indulgence for my, for my colleagues. Thank you, Commissioner Dye. I look forward to that as well. Commissioner Benzel. Uh, I have, I have uh, two questions uh, unrelated, but uh, I think it's important uh, some of the comments that uh, Commissioner Dye reference to, to note that uh, as an agency, we uh, look at the practices of ocean shipping as well as the uh, competitive uh, uh, market shares and, and assessing the agreements themselves. And the monitoring process, I think, is critical. And, and it's something we, we keep internal. Uh, but I remember uh, talking to uh, uh, Dr. Monaco uh, earlier about uh, pricing information that we received under the alliances. And as a result uh, yeah, of your uh, soup to nuts uh, assessment of the monitoring process, we made some changes on how we uh, receive and what sort of information we, we uh, uh, assess and, and, and continuing to monitor agreements under our purview. Could you to the extent that you are authorized, uh, 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 tell us a little bit about what that was. Certainly, and a lot of that will be held for the closed session, but I think to both your point and the point made by Commissioner Dye, in order for us to properly understand activities under filed agreements, we collect, as you pointed out, qualitative and quantitative information. So pricing, qualitative, 
reasons for blank sailings, qualitative. So this quantitative qualitative balance is important. With respect to pricing, it really is important that we understand while well, they're not allowed to collaborate or cooperate on pricing, in order to do an analysis of the economic outcomes of these alliances, we need to know what's happening with both capacity and pricing in that market. And because these markets are in fact many sub-markets, we need to get that information as well to really understand the factors and dimensions that drive the prices and make sure that we're able to track those and analyze those appropriately. And Dr. Wong will talk more about that in the closed session. Yeah, I mean, we, we took steps as a result of market conditions to make sure we were uh, assessing under gap principles of, uh, of accounting in terms of pricing, and, and it was the right thing to do, so uh, commended for that. Uh, uh, you know, it, it does, and I, again, following up on some of the discussion that's that's gone on, uh, uh, we assess very carefully uh, the application of of, uh, of authorities under uh, uh, under the agreement process, and I, I wish uh, uh, regulators have, that had assessed mergers would have uh, done the same thing. Since I think 1994, we've had uh, a thir uh, 16 mergers in the ocean shipping industry, um, and uh, and uh, uh, 30, uh, two com 31 companies, I believe. Uh, or 15 mergers and, and 31 companies, uh, uh, but there's been very little review of that uh, process. I wish that this agency had the ability to uh, comment on that uh, mar uh, on that market uh, uh, consolidation. And so, uh, you know, that's something we need to uh, to assess going forward because it's part and parcel of the assessment that we do uh, under uh, the agreement authority that we have. Uh, um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the macro uh, economic issues. Uh, so we're right now market uh, conditions have turned for the for the worse in terms of uh, volumes of trade, um, but a lot of things have been impacting this trade. And uh, so so while things are down now, we're uh, in the traditional buildup for the Chinese uh, New Year's is, uh, was, was slow, admittedly slow, but we've also seen reductions in uh, manufacturing in China as a result of the closures of COVID. Uh, are we in a position where uh, inventory uh, is getting uh, light uh, given uh, the closures during the Chinese New Year's and, uh, and going forward? Are we going to have later this year another uh, replication of of a swing of demand uh, that would be uh, pretty extreme given these two sort of closure periods uh, as a result of those. Certainly, um, that is an excellent point. Um, we have been tracking that. We And so when the GDP components come out next week, we'll also have additional information on what's happened with inventories in recent months. As I said, Inventories had been building up pretty substantially over the last couple of months going into the end of the year. We don't know where they are now, but my guess is we will continue to see these inventories accumulating. So we're not going to get that sort of bullwhip effect or you know this shock where um, carriers are caught unaware. We do, outside of the BTA, um, have our VOCC audit program within the commission where we talk to the individual carriers about what they're seeing and sort of reiterating our desire to understand what will happen with capacity and the fact that clawing back capacity now, if we expect you know things to swing quickly in the other direction, um, would be a concern. We don't see a lot of that right now. We absolutely saw the usual sort of you know, blankings and cancellations running into the Lunar New Year, as you um, as you noted, um, but we're not seeing a lot after that that would make us suggest that there's a lot of capacity going out, either through the alliances or through non-alliance carriage that wouldn't allow, if there was a subsequent large increase in demand for that to be accommodated. Yeah, I think we need to look at that carefully going forward because there's a lot of production. And, well, there's been some alteration to the, uh, to, uh, Vietnam and and uh, and other manufacturing locations in China or India is uh, attempting to get back into into a more aggressive uh, market uh, posture and having problems with it. But but I do think that production has been slowed down uh, and that's had an impact on uh, shipping. And and when we when that uh, 
occurs again, we might see, and that's all inventory. So I'd be interested in those numbers on the uh, inventories when they when they come come in. Uh, that's it for me, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Benzel. Commissioner Sola. Yeah, Dr. Monaco and Dr. Wong, thank you very much. As always, I always feel a little bit more enlightened after after your briefings or even when we uh, talk in your office or in private. I uh, always appreciate the information, and I can't tell you how many times that I'm researching for something and I end up on our website or look at a publication that one of you have, have published previously. Um, I, I think that what we're looking at now is change, as always. So the market's a little bit softer. Not too long ago, we were talking about congestion, and now we're talking about excess capacity and blank sailings again. And I believe that's going to be a theme going forward. Um, you know, one of my concerns or one of my interests is definitely the uh, shift from uh, cargo going to the West Coast, to the East Coast, and also to the Gulf. So in your analysis, you, it's very, uh, very clear that a lot of that cargo went that way. And I, I believe I read something that was somewhere around 15 percent. Um, do you see that going back to the West Coast or do you, do you see that staying on the East Coast and the Gulf? I would say that um, given certain uncertainties that are occurring on the West Coast um, in terms of, again, ability to absorb freight, um, labor, and other issues um, that are prevalent on the West Coast, that there is a desire to diversify the, the portfolio of terminals that can handle trade coming in from the Trans-Pacific, right? It is a substantially larger trade for us than the Transatlantic, and having some diversity to allow capacity to move through other ports aside from the West Coast seems to be something that is on the horizon for a while. If you look at newly announced services or the size of ships they're deploying on those services, you see that they seem to be building that in for the foreseeable future. So we'll continue to track um, and see, obviously, then there becomes a question of congestion, right? As I noted, as the Gulf ports got congested by taking in this additional Trans-Pacific trade, you see that their exports are not keeping pace, right? And that's a dynamic we tend to see. When congestion increases, the imports come in and the exports don't always get out. So that's something we will be very closely tracking and updating you on. I, I agree with those statements, but I'd also like to point out that the Gulf ports have a much higher export ratio than the West, port, West, port, West Coast uh, ports do. So some of them are almost 50-50 or you know, even sometimes have more exports than imports. So um, we just need to produce more to get that out. Uh, lastly, I don't know if, uh, if we could talk about it in public, uh, but I'll definitely make the, make the observation on the news today. Um, as we have excess capacity and we see the 2M Alliance uh, is going to no longer be in existence very shortly. Um, and that, that is our two largest carriers, uh, without question, coming into the United States. So generally, what you can tell us now, what, what may that look like? And I understand that it's been a long time since these two carriers were independent. So please, please enlighten us as much as you can. Um, I think it's always great to get a news alert a couple of hours before a commission <laughs> meeting about a major change to the industry. Um, so this is my preface to say I might punt a little bit on this. I think given the capacity run-ups that both carriers have engaged in very publicly over the last couple of years, and given their strong market shares, particularly on the transatlantic trades, this was probably not entirely unexpected to many people, and in fact, there have been articles in the trade press earlier in the year about whether something like this might happen. Um, the timing, so another point to um, promote our agreement library, if one goes to the agreement library for all of the alliance agreements, you can sort of see the provisions in those agreements of how long they anticipate them lasting and the provisions for those alliances to be dissolved or carriers to leave those alliances. So the timing is sort of right on time. They are, right, the announcement is sort of two years in advance, which is what the agreement says it will be, two years advance notice, right, so we're talking 2025. But both carriers really have built up their market share, built up their independent offerings to allow a certain service volume and quality and quantity that seems to make sense outside of an alliance, which is to say, 
one of the pro-competitive components of a VSA is that it allows smaller carriers to offer more frequent service, and so it gives customers more options within the market. Right? Once you hit sort of a critical mass of service offerings, it's not clear that there's as much benefit to the member carriers from that as we see sort of in other alliances that tend to have carriers with much smaller market shares. I, I concur with that. And also looking at the order book and the, the capacity that, that both of those carriers have coming online, it's, um, they're, they're an alliance by themselves. And uh, on your comment on the, uh, the trade press, I, I believe that they've both denied it for the last 18 months, and then today we found out that that's, that's not true, which is everybody knew it was coming anyway. So thank you very much. Are you, you accusing these carriers of not being completely truthful all the time, Commissioner Sola? I, I would not bet on uh, some of the statements they put out in the last six months on, on, on this uh, subject. Thank you very much, Commissioner Sola. Commissioner Vekic. Well, I appreciate uh, Commissioner Sola's uh, lust for West Coast car uh, cargo coming to the East and Gulf Coast. I mean, it's great when you get it. Um, and uh, uh, Commissioner Sola, I also wanted to agree with you on the uh, uh, these some of these carriers, those two carriers in particular. They're they're like an alliance in themselves. And there's another famous quote. I won't tell you who it's attributed to, but it's uh, quantity is a quality all of its own. So. Uh, uh, more or less, big is big is uh, big really works well. So, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Monaco, I am concerned though. I'm troubled by uh, the drop off in the cargo flow on the West Coast, uh, and um, and I mainly just want to voice that concern. I'm the only West Coast commissioner. Um, when I got onto the commission in, in last February, I think there were over 100 ships at anchor in San Pedro Bay. Or around there were maybe more at that point in time. And um, <clears throat> uh, our recent visit to LA Long Beach, uh, there were none at Anchor in San Pedro Basin. And uh, <clears throat> so that's, uh, that's troubling because the whole West Coast seems to be being um, starved of uh, cargo flow right now. And it's, I think this whole issue may invite more scrutiny down the road if, uh, Things don't normalize, um, so I am concerned about that. I mean, we bounced out of a supply unprecedented supply chain crisis, and I think in uh, and actually, I think there was a lot of real good news that came out of the West Coast, considering how much they had to deal with, and they worked through it and um, had some great leadership out there and some great efforts. And um, now I see. Um, um, amongst the carriers, Evergreen, for example, recently gave a great bonus to their uh, employees. I think they paid them five years whole salary for their uh, as a bonus recently. I mean, so some of these carriers did very well. So I'm hoping whatever it is that's uh, keeping cargo from normalizing the West Coast, they will uh, they will right size soon. And. Um, However, I'm I'm going to uh, be continue. I'm going to continue to be concerned about issues out there if they aren't um, aren't um, moving in a more uh, traditional way, and um, to where their market share, I think, uh, probably uh, historically should be. I realize China has unprecedented problems, but with these new with these new partners in India and and uh, Vietnam, and those are those are really good good news uh, customers and partners for the West Coast and Pacific Trade. So that's very encouraging. And uh, there's no need to comment, but I'll invite, uh, if you'd like to make comments, I'm, uh, I am always learn and your tables and uh, information um, that you provided uh, for this part of the hearing was, in, I think, invaluable. I mean, I've been on the docks 50 years, but I, there were things I, I still I learned when I looked at this tonight. And thank you. Um, so just for a brief um, comment on that, I agree with and understand your concern, especially as we noted that as certain amounts of volume shift, it moves congestion around. So the West Coast, right, San Pedro Bay ports did a very good job of getting that 100 plus container ship backlog worked. It's still the case that most of that volume is going in, right? There's a 
you know, there's a limit on the capacity of what can come in, but we will continue to update um, and track that and provide updates to the commission on what we're seeing in terms of those volumes and service shifts. Uh, I want to uh, thank you, Commissioner Beckage. I want to thank again, um, Dr. Monaco, Dr. Wang, and your entire team. I want to thank you for your comments, uh, particularly those comments emphasizing the importance of informed compliance among regulated entities, such as you know ocean carriers, um, marine terminal operators, and ocean transportation intermediaries, uh, freight forwarders, and on vessel operating common carriers, et cetera. Um, the, the importance of knowing their obligations under our regulations and following them without extensive warnings or reminders from FMC is, 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 is high. Uh, because of our limited resources, we're not able to engage in extended back and forth um, and the establishment of the Office of Compliance within the Bureau of Enforcement, Investigation, and Compliance shows the FMC's increased focus on compliance as a potential enforcement matter. So it's the intention of this commission that BTA will work readily with the Office of Compliance, but we want to encourage these regulated entities to be responsive to the Bureau of Trade Analysis and not wait until the Office of Compliance is involved. Um, it just, it'll, it'll save you time and, and, uh, uh, and hassle and headache. So. Uh, I, I do a, a, a hope that they all got that uh, message. I want to agree with Commissioner Dye about our robust uh, uh, monitoring program. Um, uh, our continue in, in effect, I feel that we do a continuous, never-ending antitrust investigation on all of the alliances, um, and I think that's very important, and particularly um, with the I mean, change in market conditions. I, I mean, that's. A, the fairly innocuous uh, phrase for what we've seen over the last couple of years, an extreme uh, uh, increase in demand, uh, and huge price increases, followed by lowering uh, of prices more dramatically, at least than I won't speak for anybody else, but far more dramatically than I expected, and I expected a fairly dramatic drop. Um, does that, are there any particular challenges of having to monitor the competitiveness uh, the, 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 of the alliances and the carriers uh, individually um, and, and whether they're competing uh, uh, according to the Shipping Act d during such a, a huge volatile time? So I would say the uniqueness of the FMC and us being able to quickly pivot and acquire the additional information we need during unusual times has really been invaluable. And obviously the ability of staff to quickly pivot and analyze that information and bring back results has been truly impressive. So I would say that we are remarkably well positioned and we've also learned, you know, taking this as a learning opportunity through the pandemic, how can we quickly assess to make sure we're getting the information we need seeing if it's out there anywhere else on the landscape where we can acquire it, and if not, going back to agreement parties and saying this is the information we need to do our analysis. So um, you even change your information requirements as, as the market changes? Absolutely. Uh, I, I, uh, Mr. Huey, I, I forget whether it was you or um, uh, Dr. Monaco who talked about how um, these uh, agreements are, are not a carte blanche, um, if, the, if there's a, a violation of something that's not within the scope of the agreement. Um, is that still a violation of the Shipping Act if they, if they do, say, have an agreement that says that they, uh, they can negotiate uh, space sharing but they can't negotiate prices, but they, but they do talk about prices? Is that a violation of the Shipping Act? What, what, what would happen with that, Mr. Huey? Well, that would be conduct um, using the agreement as a platform to engage in conduct outside the scope of the agreement, I think is what you're describing. Yes, exactly. Um, and uh, that would make the agreement activity itself violative of the Shipping Act, and presumably we would seek to enjoin it uh, because it's, uh, it's using an agreement as a platform to engage in activity that the agreement itself doesn't... Uh, isn't intended to enable. I mean, that's what happened uh, several years ago with a, a number of car carriers, if I remember correctly. Was that correct? Uh, I, I think that was outside of the, the scope. I think that was uh, price fixing um, that was done very clumsily in a chain of emails. Um, uh, right. I don't think there that, were, actually, that was, I guess you're right. It, was, it isn't completely <laughs> the same because there was no agreement at all, I think, at that point. Yeah. Yes, that, that was uh, an antitrust uh, matter, but it, it was very clumsy price fixing. Okay. So if they're not protected by the agreement, though, they are in violation of traditional antitrust laws. They have no protection is essentially what you were saying. 
Yes, it's an exemption so long as you operate under the scope of the agreement that the agency has allowed to go into effect. Um, so it's the exemption is constrained by the agreement itself. Great. Um, in turn, thank you very much. That's, I think it's helpful to make sure people understand that. Uh, in terms of our uh, monitoring, obviously spot rates have declined a, a lot. I realize that contract rates are under confidential contract, so we can't talk about you know, individual ones, of course, but um, do we have any idea whether in general contract rates are also falling along with spot rates uh, or are contract rates still as high as they as they were during the pandemic or something in between? Dr. Monaco. So we don't have a great deal of visibility at scale to um, all of the service contract filings. Last year we had an unprecedented year for service contract original filings plus amendments at over a million. We also have very strong numbers going into this year, which sort of conveys two pieces of information. One, that um, there's still a robust amount of service contracts being filed, and they are amended quite frequently. Um, sometimes that's because of bunker surcharges. Sometimes that's to renegotiate rates. So we continue to track that. Um, but there has been a downward pressure on service contract rates generally as there's been this invert, inversion between the service contracts um, that are often you know, negotiated months in advance and what's happening with the spot rate. And we continue to track that sort of generally. So there may be a lag, but generally speaking, declines in spot rates are an indicator of, of declines in contract rates. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, look, I... This is along the lines of uh, what Commissioner Sola was asking. I, I know that this, I, I want everybody to forgive me. I used to be a journalist long ago. I went to journalism school. We've got breaking news, okay? Um, this this breakup of MSC and, and Maersk, you know, it, it's the maritime uh, uh, container shipping equivalent of Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston all over again. I mean, let's face it, you know, they're, they're going their separate ways. Uh, so... Uh, I, 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 it's a stretch. Okay. Um, it, it just reminds me, reminds me, uh, in our, in our world, but I do want to ask a couple of uh, questions about that. Uh, the, the first one is just to get your take, uh, Dr. Monaco on, uh, with, this was, uh, in one of the stories today, Maersk's head of ocean shipping, Johan, uh, Sigar, Sigsgard, uh, told Reuters that, uh, we've been fighting about, uh, he's with uh, Maersk, obviously, and he's talking about the relationship with MSC. We've been fighting fiercely over customers and market share over the last eight years as, they, as they've been in the same alliance. He says, I don't see increased competition as a result of this breakup. Is that, do you think that's completely true? Is it partially true? What is your take on that? Will there be increased competition at all if they, if they go their separate ways? Can I opt just to discuss Brad Pitt and his various yeah. relationships over time? Um, I think it's very much the case that these carriers compete with each other very much, right? And this is something that, so this is to say that that statement sort of aligns with what we see within other alliances as well um, and what carriers would tell you and what we see happening now with rates, racing to the bottom, right? So you mentioned, sir, you didn't expect rates to fall this fast. Rates are falling fast because they're competing with each other to get the traffic and this is pushing prices down. And this occurs in lots of markets, right? And they absolutely compete. I think every carrier will give you an analogy of how they see themselves in the market. We are the blank of ocean carriage, right? That's how they market themselves to the public. And I think the trade um, this morning in Maersk has made it very clear for several months that what they're trying to offer to the market is an integrated service, right? And at their scale and volume now, they think that they're able to do this without, you know, a, a closely held alliance, which again, the nice thing about the ocean industry is that they also can increase flexibility and partnerships through slot charters and other arrangements. So this is a large alliance that's breaking up, but both MSC and Maersk avail themselves of other FMC filed agreements to make sure that they hit a certain capacity and service reliability. And so um, I think there's not going to be a great deal of shakeout on this. They very much compete with each other, as you can see with their volumes and market shares changing over time. So I think that's probably a... The pro-competitive and anti-competitive effects basically balance out of, yes, sir. of that, these things. Okay, um, so uh, look, if, if we're talking about the, the fallen rates and it's due to a competition, I do have to say that I believe that the pressure 
that the Bureau of Trade Analysis puts on them, um, you know, uh, backed up by our uh, Enforcement Bureau and uh, the, all of the, uh, the the complex and, and extensive monitoring that you do is a big part of that. So, um, you know, we, we can say, well, it's all due to the market. I think that that your uh, you, your department is an important part of that, and I want to highlight that. And thank you, Dr. Monaco. Um, I am a little concerned, and this is my last question on this, but I am a little concerned that when MSC and Maersk go their separate ways, and this is until 2015, but that we will have we will get less information uh, from both carriers, still the biggest carriers in the world, but because they're no longer going to be in that alliance agreement, some of our uh, uh, of our authority, and I don't know whether it's regulatory or legal authority, but uh, if, if Mr. Huey wants to chime in on that, that's fine. I'm not asking him to, but but some of our authority to collect this information will will disappear. So, do are, are we going to think about that? I guess I, I mean I assume you are already thinking about that. So I think we can talk um, a little bit more in closed session. I will say. Um, we use a lot of publicly available information to complement the confidentially collected information as part of our monitoring program to understand and assess what's going on in the market. Um, so there is a, right, all of the charts presented this morning are based upon peers, right, and other data sources. There are publicly available sources of information that complement and allow us to have context as to what carriers are doing, even if we're not collecting that information directly. Um, but we can maybe chat a little bit more about this in closed session. We will. But, Mr. Huey, is it, it is true that though our authority to collect some of that detailed information would decline if they're not in an alliance? Is there, or I can ask either one of you. It doesn't need to be. Yeah. Yeah, currently the bulk of the information we collect on these carriers is done through our monitoring program. Okay, thank you very much. Um, because I spoke too, so long and, you know, this, this I mean, this is PTSD to... Pitt and Aniston all over again thing. Uh, I just want to check with my colleagues, see if there's any other additional follow-up or comment. Commissioner Dye. No, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think this is an excellent discussion, and um, I look forward to doing it more often. I respect you so much, Commissioner Dye. I want to make sure that everybody knows that she was shaking her head no when I was making this comparison, that these are not similar, <laughs> similar <laughs> things. So uh, anyway, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, Commissioner Commissioner Benzel. So we were vying for the most inappropriate comment. You had Brad Pitt and uh, Jennifer Aniston. I had Calvin Coolidge in the center your, for the your, Philadelphia. Your vicious Eagles. attack no. on, on yeah. President Coolidge. <laughs> so no, no, no further comments. Uh, questions. <laughs> thank you, Commissioner Benzel. Commissioner Sola. Commissioner Sola, always the wisest one. Commissioner Vekic. All right. Uh, so with that, um, uh, I want to um, thank the commission. My uh, understanding is that is the last uh, open session. Okay. So uh, between the we, like I said, uh, we will have to do a closed session. Um, so between um, the open and closed session, we will do. Uh, a brief recess. Um, I'd like to reconvene at 11.45 sharp, if that's okay with everybody. I do, uh, I want to thank uh, the public, uh, particularly the public that's actually here in person. Um, I'm sorry that we're going to have to uh, ask you to, to leave at this point, um, but I, I very much appreciate your attention to this. Um, and as I say, I think we, you know, we joke sometimes, but the implementation of ASRA and the work that uh, the Bureau of Trade Analysis uh, does in terms of monitoring our are our bread and butter. They're they're very key things, and I really appreciate the time and attention uh, that we've been given today. So thank you very much for the staff, and thank you for all of the participants.